video two, democratization of publishing. The internet has the potential for a vast democratization of mass communication, of publishing. Mass communication in the Western world can be said to have started with Gutenberg's printing press that enabled the publication of books and then newspapers as well that were available relatively cheaply and in large quantities. Unlike the earlier manuscripts that were extremely expensive and only belonged to the richest people or to important institutions. But producing these books, so buying books may be quite cheap, but producing the books, magazines and papers was still expensive, time consuming, and demanded access to rare technology, the printing press. Later, other forms of mass communication like commercial theater, recorded music, film, radio, television were expensive and demanded unique technologies. They are usually produced by big companies or by the government. It was often easy to access these items, buy a movie ticket, turn on the TV, buy a paper, but it was almost impossible for a regular person to appear and influence these media. Sure, there were letters to the editor or public broadcast opportunities in local cable channels, things like that, but even those were highly regulated. The internet offered a kind of revolution. Since the 1990s, almost anyone with an access to the internet could publish a website that will be available to the entire world. Unless its, its contents were illegal in some way, no one could tell you what uh, to write or what to broadcast um, to anyone who wants to read it. In the 2000s, the biggest platforms were blogs, sites with a periodical stream of new content. Later on, social media like uh, Twitter and Facebook be became the place where anyone could broadcast their uh, writing and any other content and have the potential to be read by thousands, thousands even millions of people. For an individual broadcasting, on the web, especially if we're talking about writing and not actually to start producing videos for YouTube, the cost um, varies from between uh, quite low, if you want your own site, that might cost, uh, cost a, some money, to absolutely free uh, on, abs uh, on most social media and networks and blog platforms. Publishing is free for the individual producer because the social network like Facebook uh, make money out of people reading your content. So you get to broadcast for free and they get to make money out of what you broadcast. Broadcasting moved from being the privilege of a few to being available to many, many people. That said, not everyone has the technology like a computer uh, or the technological literacy, the know-how in order to access the web at all. These people get shut out of the internet conversation altogether. So today, almost anyone can broadcast, send his message or their message to the entire world. But the fact that there's so much people broadcasting means that the competition for the attention of, of the media consumers is fiercer than ever. You can broadcast, but nobody promises you that uh, anyone is willing to receive what you're sending. While well, some Twitter accounts have millions of followers, most only have tens. If at all, this is not always determined by the quality of the content, but by other factors like pre-existing fame and the amount of money one is willing to pay to boast or advertise 
their content. This means that the internet attention economy is not always as equal as we sometimes imagine. So I'm talking about democratization, but it's important to remember that it's not like anyone at any moment can become, um, can reach an audience of millions. There's a specific situation in which this happens. Still, Though not complete, this democratization of mass communication has huge impact on our politics and our society, the way we live. But uh, today I'm focusing on literature. In the past, the hurdles for publishing a story, a poem, and certainly a novel were quite high. First, an editor had to accept the manuscript, what you wrote, and then they would have to convince their bosses that what you were, uh, wrote was worth publishing. Even if the book was published, then the publishers, salespeople, had to convince bookstores to carry that book. And even then, it would only be in the bookstores for a number of months if it did not uh, become a bestseller. Few of the published books were ever reviewed or read widely, and even fewer became permanent parts of the culture, for instance, by going on reading lists for colleges and universities. So even books that were published received little attention sometimes. Uh, but there were a lot of um, gatekeepers on the way to publication and uh, widespread attention. We sometimes call uh, these editors, publishers, reviewers, gatekeepers. That is uh, people who decide who gets into the world of literature and who is left outside of the world of literature. And they had a huge impact still do to some extent in the world of printed books and mainstream literature. But in the age of the internet, gatekeepers lose much of their power that they had in the past because they had access to technology and, and printing presses and, and the way to um, sell the books and send them to the stores. They had all that in the past. Today, it's less relevant. If you want to publish a poem today and have it available for the entire world to see, you can do so with a few clicks. I mean, first you have to write the poem, but once you wrote the poem, it's really easy to make it available for everyone. You don't need an editor's approval. In the 90s and still today, to some extent, there were um, sites dedicated to sharing your literature. Some writers open blogs like I talked about earlier and published every few days or every, every few weeks. Uh, today, I think uh, sites like Facebook pages uh, are very popular for sharing your own poetry. Now, for, it's for your Facebook friends, but you can have um, hundreds and thousands of uh, Facebook friends and more people can follow you if you become popular. There's a trend of Instagram poetry or Insta poetry. Usually it's quite simple, short poems, but presented not just as text, but in a way that's uh, also visually pleasing and fits in with the aesthetics of Instagram. Most of these web-published poets will not receive much attention, for sure. But some, some poets combine internet savvy, knowing how to promote themselves on the internet, and an aesthetic sensibility that fits the age of cell phones and Instagram to gain a very large following, uh, following that would be almost unimaginable for most poets who go the more traditional route. 
let's have a quick look at one example. My bag is a buzz, a text, a flirtation, a thanks for my boss, oh, ghost vibration. So we look at this and it immediately screams Instagram aesthetic, Instagram look. And um, the bright pink, the elegant purse. Well, here the poem itself is about internet communication through the cell phone. The phone is on vibrate mode and it shakes her whole bag actually like the sound effect of the bag is a, a buzz or gives you the vibration. But as long as it is in the bag, she does not know if this is a flirtation from a romantic partner, something she hopes for, something exciting, or something more boring like a thanks from her boss, which it probably turns out to be. There is potential there. That's why the vibrations are ghostly. We still don't know if they have substance. Uh, I wouldn't say it's a bad poem. The sound effects are nice at the beginning. Still, it's not an especially deep or complex poem. You can read it once or twice and move on because you're going down the Instagram feed and you have a fashion shoot you want to look at or a famous actor you want to look at. But the point is that Nobody asked me if it was a good poem. Literature instructors, literature professors are also a kind of gatekeeper. The writer made the decision to publish the poem through Instagram, and they have 123,000 followers to enjoy or ignore the poem, but they decide themselves. It's, they don't need editors or publishers or literature professors to decide for them. The story with novels is a little different. Few people publish whole novels for free on social media. First, you make the effort to write a, no, a whole novel. You want to some kind of pay, though you will not always get it. Second, few people will have the patience uh, for a long work in the context of social media or blogs. Still, it exists, but more significant for novel is the spread of self-publishing. In the world of uh, print, of traditional publishing, self-publishing is often scoffed at, made fun of. It means looked down on. It means you spent a lot of your own money thousands and, and thousands of, of dollars uh, to put out a book that nobody is going to promote, nobody is going to work hard apart from you in order to sell. And very few will probably read it therefore. But in the world of the internet, the cost of publishing electronic books can be extremely low. Many writers, especially in genres like uh, romance and or detective fiction, popular genres found that it is possible to make uh, quite a lot of money by publishing their own ebooks on platforms like Amazon. They write, edit, and promote their own books. They do it all themselves or with uh, some kind of partner or in groups of authors. They use social media, word of mouth, and Amazon's recommendation algorithms to get to their audience. Traditional gatekeepers like editors become less relevant. Apparently, there are genres today where most authors start out publishing independently, and only when they show that they have an existing fan base or following um, do traditional publishers sign them on and actually print it as print books on paper. This trend has not reached what we usually call literary fiction, where traditional gatekeepers are still very important, but one day it might be the same as with the popular genres. I don't know. Possibly the next Virginia Woolf may start out by self-publishing 
their first masterpiece as an ebook they promote on Twitter. What are the consequences of opening the gates or making publications so easy? Why is this important? First, we must say that sometimes quality suffers. If nobody is selecting, then a lot of bad writing gets out there. That said, there's a fair degree of selection through word of mouth and the algorithms. So if people don't like what they read, it won't get recommended to other people. If something is just boring, odds are it will not reach a large audience. Of course, some good things never reach a large audience either. And of course, traditional publishing also publishes a lot of bad stuff. Other trends I think are more interesting though. First, there's, a more, uh, there's more diversity in the voices that can speak up when there are less gatekeepers. Gatekeepers are not objective judges of some pure quality. They are fallible human beings. As such, they have their own taste shaped by their social identity and their education. They have uh, projections about the, uh, what would sell according to limited information. They often prefer writers who are like them, as people do. When the gatekeepers are mostly white, fairly well off, and men, as the case was in uh, the West for most of modern history, then the writers who get published also tend to uh, be uh, white, well off men or writers who cater, who offer to their taste, who offer things that white men like. On the internet, there are more opportunities for excluded groups and identities to express themselves. You see this uh, with uh, social categories like African-American or trans people but it's also observable simply for people with very specific interests. That's if you are really into love stories about airplane pilots from the 1960s, you will find a community with writers and readers who are into exactly that. I'm actually not sure, it's just something I made up. Maybe nobody's into that. This is a source of diversity. There is room for all kinds of interests and agendas and identities because publishing has become much more easy. But this diversity with um, and this diversity with something for anyone also creates echo cham chambers. Internet echo chambers are communities that tend to communicate only within themselves and do not receive information or even send it often uh, from the outside. Their members tend therefore to have a mistaken perception of what people um, at large are thinking and to have their own beliefs confirmed again and again. And I'm talking about like other people are in echo chambers, but each and every one of us, if we're on the internet and using social media, we have our own echo chambers. Echo chambers are very, very pro problematic when it comes to politics and other social issues. That's if you are against vaccines and then most of your friends online are anti-vaccine as well, you will tend to think that this is a overwhelmingly popular opinion. And in fact, you may think that it's a correct opinion just because you know a lot of people who believe it. With literature, there is less risk, uh, risk of catching a deadly disease because of, a, of the echo chamber effect. But I think that the internet does definitely fragment the literary world. People who like stories about pilots from the 60s will tend to live within a community and get a sense that this is a crucial part of what fiction can be. I'm exaggerating a little bit, uh, not a little bit. I'm exaggerating a lot to make the point. Sometimes members of minority groups can create a community around their identity, but uh, not have a large impact on the general discourse. They're talking about among themselves, 
feeling maybe like they're making an impact, but the world is not changing as much as it seems. And then you're, you can be very, very surprised when you meet somebody who totally disagrees with you and sees things totally different. Usama, the lowering of cost and ease of entrance into publishing creates more published material, but most of it remains unread by anyone, but, to some, um, but some is very successful. This process offers us a much more diverse literary world with writers and subjects that were rare or non-existent in traditional publishing, but um, also a literary world that is fragmented into small communities with specific identities and interests. Many of these processes are highly visible in the world of fan fiction, fiction based on characters and settings created by other authors. This type of writing cannot be usually published in traditional venues because of copyright laws. You can't use somebody else's characters to make money unless you pay them. That's one reason copyright law is one reason uh, um, fan fiction flourished on the internet. The other reasons have to do with the ease of publication that the internet offers and its ability to build communities uh, with uh, very niche interests, exactly the thing that I talked about in this video.